Exercise 10 deals with the central nervous system. The central nervous system is comprised of the spinal cord and the brain. And then the brain itself is divided into subdivisions, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the brainstem, and the diencephalon. So we're going to start with the brain first, specifically with the cerebrum. This is about 80% of the mass of the brain. It is composed of two hemispheres or two parts. We refer to these as the cerebral hemispheres. They are separated by what's known as the longitudinal fissure. However, they are connected to each other. The corpus callosum is a bundle of axon, which are the nerve fibers that will connect uh, the two cerebral hemispheres to each other so there can be communication between them. One thing with the brain, certainly in the cerebrum is true, um, is that the gray matter is on the surface and the white matter is deeper. This will be different in the spinal cord. In terms of the function of the cerebrum, this is where your memory is, your emotions, all of your higher le level cognitive functions occur here in the cerebrum. This is where you're receiving a lot of the sensory information and interpreting and determining do you respond and if so, what type of a response should it be. And so on this diagram, you can see um, both the lateral and the anterior view. What I am circling around this way is the cerebrum itself. Um, you can see the dotted lines on this diagram, the corpus callosum that is outlined that connects the two hemispheres together. So on the anterior view, this portion is the cerebrum. The cerebral cortex, uh, cortex always refers more to the surface. And you'll notice different uh, features. There will be ridges and grooves. The ridges are the gyres, the celsus is the groove. The cerebral cortex or the cerebrum can be divided into different lobes or subdivisions. The temporal, parietal, frontal, and occipital, they are named by the region of near where you can find them. Once again, you see terminology comes into play. So the area that is highlighted with the red is the frontal lobe. Uh, kind of the darker gray is the parietal lobe. On the side, the blue is the temporal lobe. In the back, the green is the occipital lobe. This is another diagram showing um, with the cerebrum that you can see on the coronal section that the gray matter is on the surface, the white matter is deeper. You can see where the corpus callosum is located. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you've got the sagittal view, which also shows the corpus callosum, uh, that bundle of right here it would be that bundle of axons that connect the two sides to each other. The diencephalon connects the cerebrum with the other parts of the brain as well as to the spinal cord. It contains uh, three main components, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. And in the epithalamus, there will be the pineal gland. So when we look at a picture of the diencephalon, you can see highlighted in green, kind of an egg shape, is the thalamus. A lot of nerves are going to be passing through there. It's often referred to as a relay station. Your hypothalamus is the orangish color. Uh, you'll notice, you'll see this when we look at the endocrine gland, but attached just below the hypothalamus right here, are your pituitary glands. And the pineal gland that I mentioned just a bit ago is right here below the thalamus. So as I said, the thalamus is a relay station. It helps to send information from the spinal cord and other areas of the brain up to the cerebrum, as well as from the cerebrum back down. As this information is passing through, it is processing some of the information, determining, OK, what do we need to do with this? The hypothalamus is one of the first things that comes to mind is its role with homeostasis, helping to maintain that internal balance or equilibrium within the body from everything from temperature to blood pH uh, to levels of different things such as sodium, calcium. It's regulating everything. 
the hypothalamus is involved certainly with the nervous system as we're studying it now you'll see it's an example of how some um, organs are involved with more than one system it also plays a huge role with the endocrine system because it does produce some hormones um, it's involved not only as part of the central nervous system it's in part of what we call the autonomic nervous system of which you do not have any voluntary control over it it's going to respond automatically to different situations some of the nerves that pass through here are involved with also what we refer to as the limbic system which has to do with memory and emotions the brain stem is what will connect the other parts of the brain directly then to the spinal cord. It's composed of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. So this is showing the lighter area, or bluish green area on the top is the midbrain. As you can see, it's right below the thalamus and hypothalamus. Uh, it's below the cerebrum. Beneath the midbrain is the pons. It looks like it has this little swelling to it. And then beneath that is the medulla. And the medulla is what then becomes continuous with the spinal cord. The midbrain is going to help coordinate a lot of your sensory information, um, meaning your visual, your auditory, somatosensory perception. The pons connects the cerebellum to the brainstem and then the medulla as I said connects everything to the, from the brain to the spinal cord. Um, the brainstem helps to control a lot of the regulation for your heart rate, your respiration rate, things such as that which is why it's not quite as well protected as the cerebrum and so um, if the brainstem is suffers injury it can be devastating from the standpoint it does help to control that cardiovascular and respiratory systems the cerebellum it's comparing information that's coming from the cerebrum and it information initially that was from the peripheral nerves down your arms your legs basically everywhere except the brain and spinal cord that's being sent up to the brain for analysis the cerebrum is going to help interpret a lot of this information and try to come up with a nice coordinated type of movement. Let's say you need to respond with a muscle movement. You don't want it to be all jerky. It wants to be very smooth and controlled. One feature in the cerebellum is that it also has uh, two hemispheres just like the cerebrum. If you do a dissection of those hemispheres you will notice the white matter. It just it looks like a tree with extensive branching kind of like a huge oak tree and all the massive branches and so that white matter there in the cerebellum we call the arbor vitae which means tree of life and so you can see on this diagram that the see, back here it's in the back and at the base of the brain is where the cerebellum is and you can certainly see all of this white matter here, how it does look like a tree with all the extensive branching. And so that's why it's called the arbor vitae there. The spinal cord, if you look at the different regions of it in general, the posterior regions of the spinal cord are receiving sensory information. The anterior regions are motor. You'll notice a difference with the spinal cord as compared to the brain in that the gray matter is deeper, but the white matter is now superficial. The spinal cord is divided into different regions. Um, you have the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral regions. When we look at the spinal cord, the gray matter we refer to as horns, so we call them the gray horns, and it's more or less in the shape of a butterfly. Uh, we divide the that gray area into different regions um, so not only do we call them horns but we also give them regional terms such as posterior horn which as I said earlier the posterior region is going to be having sensory information anterior horn is going to be more motor uh, the lateral horn is more with the sympathetic division so you can see here that um, on this cross section of an actual 
uh, spinal cord on the bottom and the schematic drawing on top, that yes, in the very, very middle, be right here in the middle is the central canal. And then you have the difference, as you can see, the gray matter that looks uh, like a butterfly. And like I said, we call them horns. The white matter we call columns. You'll notice some books may call them the funiculi. And once again, we give them names by the location. So posterior column, because it's in the posterior area, it's receiving sensory information, the anterior column, and the lateral columns. So some of these are receiving both sensory and motor. In terms of blood supply that's coming to the brain, uh, we will look at that in more detail when we're covering the cardiovascular system. However, just be aware that there are multiple routes of blood supply to the brain, and this is done intentionally so that in case one route gets blocked, there is still another route or another pathway of getting blood to the brain. That way, because the brain is basically controlling and regulating everything in the body, it needs to have a good supply of blood. It needs to have an uninterrupted supply. And so that's why you have multiple routes. So like I said, in case one gets blocked, you're still getting blood up to the brain. The brain is also very fragile from the standpoint the tissue is, is so important you do not want it exposed to toxins or excessive um, adverse chemicals etc you don't want to take a chance of an infection with it and so there is extra precautions to protect the brain so that anything in the blood cannot pass directly from the blood to the brain there is what we call the blood brain barrier this will also be discussed in more detail with the cardiovascular system, but just be aware that there are these extra protections in place. There are also coverings around both the brain and the spinal cord. This is known as the meninges. Um, it's made out of connective tissue. It's a membrane that does cover both the brain and spinal cord to protect it. This is divided into multiple layers, so it's three main layers. The outermost layer is the dura mater. This will be attached directly to the bone, such as in the brain. The arachnoid mater, this is the middle layer. Um, and then the pia mater is the innermost layer, and this will be directly attached to the brain or to the spinal cord, depending on the location that you're in. The spaces that are between these layers, some of these are filled with fluid. So you can see in this drawing of the brain where you have the bone, you have just below the bone and attached to the bone is going to be up here will be the dura mater. Beneath that is the subdural space. You then are going to have the arachnoid mater, that middle layer, which is labeled right here. You then have the subarachnoid space and then the pia mater which is attached directly to um, the brain itself. So if we look at it in this um, kind of flow chart if you will, like I say you have the bone. Between the bone and the dura mater is the epidural space that was found in the vertebral column. Uh, so if you receive an epidural, that's where they are going to be injecting the medication. The epidural space is not present in the, uh, the skull with the brain. It's only in the vertebral column. So you have the dura mater, you have the subdural space, the arachnoid mater. Now, in that subarachnoid space, that space between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater, this is where uh, the CSF, CSF is your cerebral spinal fluid. That's where it is going to be. So if you need to have, say, a spinal tap done where they need to remove some of that uh, cerebral spinal fluid, test it to see if it's contaminated, say, with bacteria or virus, if you have an infection. It should be sterile, um, should be nice and clear. So if they have to remove it, they will remove it. Um, they will basically take a needle and go into that subarachnoid space to remove some of that fluid. And that will be done in the vertebral column um, in order to access it more easily.
And this is just a different diagram. Different people think, see things differently. Some diagrams may help some people and it might not help others. So that's why I have a variety of different pictures just to kind of help you place that. The ventricular system refers to the ventricles or the chambers that are present in the brain and then the cerebral spinal fluid. So that CSF is going to circulate around the brain, around the spinal cord. It's removing any waste products. Eventually it gets returned to the blood. Why is it there? It's, it's helping, it does act kind of like a shock absorber. Um, it helps to cushion the, both the brain and the spinal cord. It helps to remove things, um, waste products. And then like I say, it will be returned to the blood uh, supply. There are four ventricles. There are uh, two lateral ventricles. There's a right and a left. Those are both within the cerebrum. And then they flow uh, into, the fluid from there will flow from each of those into the third ventricle that's within the diencephalon. And then that is connected, um, the interventricular foramen is what connects the lateral ventricles to that third ventricle. And then the cerebral aqueduct connects the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, which is located between the cerebellum and the pons and the upper portion of the medulla. So your cerebral spinal fluid, uh, there are specialized cells uh, that will produce the cerebral spinal fluid by what they do essentially is they filter the blood. So not everything in the blood goes into the cerebral spinal fluid. These specialized cells, they're the epidemal cells, they are located in what's known as the choroid plexus. So that's where they're going to filter the blood and uh, remove some of the fluid that becomes the cerebral spinal fluid. And as I said earlier, from the choroid plexus, it's going to flow in the lateral ventricles to the third to the fourth ventricle. From there, it is going to either flow down the central canal, the spinal cord, and then back up towards the brain, or it's going to flow into the subarachnoid space where it gets reabsorbed. It's reabsorbed by the arachnoid granulations, and it will flow to the dural sinuses. And then, as I said, it will be returned back to the blood circulation. And so this diagram here is showing um, the choroid plexus. If we are up here where it's being, the cerebral spinal fluid is being produced. And, out of this. and then it's going to flow into the lateral ventricles down to the third ventricle and then down here to the fourth ventricle and then it either goes down here the central canal or it comes around this way and will end up in the subarachnoid space eventually it will be reabsorbed as i said and will go um, into the dural sinuses and then back to the blood supply so this is just kind of a brief explanation and description of the central nervous system, which is looking at just the brain and the spinal cord.